All right, everybody. Hello and welcome to our final lecture on The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Today we're going to finish things up with Chapter 9. But first, a quick reminder of what happened in Chapter 8. Gatsby died. End of recap. So one of the early things that happened in this chapter is a very peculiar way of describing the body of Gatsby. Notice these quotes. But all of this part of it seemed remote and unessential. I found myself on Gatsby's side and alone. From the moment I telephoned news of the catastrophe to West Egg Village, every surmise about him and every practical question was referred to me. At first, I was surprised and confused. Then, as he lay in his house and didn't move or breathe or speak, hour upon hour, it grew upon me that I was responsible because no one else was interested. Interested, I mean, with that intense personal interest to which everyone has some vague right at the end. He's describing a dead body here, okay? But he sits and says that he lay in the house and didn't move, didn't breathe, didn't speak. He's a dead body. He's not going to do these things. And yet, Nick is really struggling to say things like this. He goes on. I called up Daisy half an hour after we found him. Not after we found him dead, just after we found him. And so you'll remember the previous chapter, we just had that mattress that was laden, the air mattress. And so there's uh, real reluctance to list the body as dead. Next, I wanted to go into the room where he lay and reassure him. Again, very strange language for a living person, for a dead person. Other people come. As they drew back the sheet and looked at Gatsby with unmoved eyes, his protest continued in my brain. Look here, old sport, you've got to get somebody for me. You've got to try hard. And I can't go through this alone. This is a made up conversation, right? It's in his brain. But notice this very interesting thing. Looked at Gatsby with unmoved eyes. Here, unmoved eyes could refer to Gatsby or it could refer to the people that are looking which is the antecedent is they. So there's this interesting tension that arises with that little bit of a prepositional phrase there. That's very playful, not playful, but oh, enjoyable. Right? This ambiguity that they're generating. But then at last, Nick gets so frustrated by people calling, thinking that Gatsby's still alive, that he declares with great finitude, Mr. Gatsby's dead. Gatsby is dead, not Gats, all right? So that's going to be an interesting point of interpretation. Well, at the death of Mr. Gatsby, Mr. Gats shows up. He's like nothing we came to expect. I think it was on the third day that a telegram signed, Henry C. Gats arrived from a town in Minnesota. It said only that the sender was leaving immediately and to postpone the funeral until he came. It was Gatsby's father, a solemn old man, very helpless and dismayed, bundled up in a long, cheap ulster against the warm September day. His eyes leaked continuously with excitement, and when I took the bag and umbrella from his hands, he began to pull so incessantly at his sparse gray beard that I had difficulty in getting off his coat. He was on the point of collapse, so I took him into the music room and made him sit down while I sent for something to eat. But he wouldn't eat, and the glass of milk spilled from his trembling hand. After a little while, Mr. Gatz opened the door and came out, his mouth ajar, his face flushed slightly, his hand, eyes leaking, isolated and unpunctual tears. He had reached an age where death no longer had the quality of ghastly surprise. And when he looked around him now for the first time and saw the height and splendor of the hall and the great rooms opening out from the other rooms, his grief began to be mixed with an awful pride. Notice these small details here. The fact that Gatsby's father has a sorry cheap coat on against the wind, and he's old, he's solemn, uh, but especially like helpless and dismayed. Right? These are not aspects that we've come to associate with his son in any ways. Uh, this nervous tick of pulling at his gray beard, something that is quite different as well to the way in which Gatsby stood in the world. And then when he goes in and sees the body and comes back, we see that he's just struggling to adjust to it. And uh, he had reached an age where death no longer has the quality of ghastly surprise. This word ghastly has appeared a few times. 
And uh, it's, um, it gives us a sense that he, for the father, it's not so much the death of his son that's going to matter as the death of something else, maybe something that he represented. Because notice what happens, that once Gatz, Mr. Gatz begins to take in the hall and the size of things, his grief began to be mixed with an odd pride, right? He's impressed with the house. And here is the point at which we see a strong family resemblance. Because you'll remember how we talked about Miss uh, Jay Gatsby being interested in Daisy's house and seduced almost by her house. So some more calls come and we get a very odd one with the guest whom we saw a long time ago doing those liver exercises. He's the piano player, Clip Springer. And he calls and he says, oh, you know, I probably can't make the funeral, but can you send me some shoes that I forgot? And then Nick says the following. After that, I felt a certain shame for Gatsby. One gentleman to whom I telephoned implied that he had got what he deserved. However, that was my fault, for he was one of those who used to sneer most bitterly at Gatsby on the courage of Gatsby's liquor. And I should have known better than to call him. This is a really important line. Right? Because we get this sense of the kind of people that came to Gatsby's parties. This was a person that would never have sneered at Gatsby, like mocked him or said the things behind his back, except that he drinks Gatsby's liquor and gains the confidence, right? So there's this paradox. Gatsby provides the liquor to kind of like get people social and recognize them. But by giving them that liquor, they then in turn on Gatsby. There's this really complex um, inner relationship between Gatsby and his guests that we see in this moment. Gatsby tries getting uh, Volsheim to help out and come to the funeral. Volsheim has two quick lines, two rules of friendship. First, let us learn to show our friendship for a man when he is alive and not after he is dead, he suggested. After that, my own rule is to let everything alone. So the first point seems quite strong, right? You need to show your friendship when a person's living, not just do things for them when they're dead. That makes sense. But the second is, after that, let everything alone. So this is Wolfsheim's way of saying he's not going to get involved with anything. Again, all this serves to further isolate Nick in these moments. We then jump back to Mr. Gatz. And Mr. Gatz has been carrying a photograph that his son sent him. After changing my clothes, I went next door and found Mr. Gatz walking up and down excitedly in the hall. His pride in his son and in his son's possessions was continually increasing. And now he had something to show me. Jimmy sent me this picture. He took out his wallet with trembling fingers. Look here, there. It was a photograph of the house, cracked in the corners and dirty with many hands. He pointed out every detail to me eagerly. Look there and then sought admiration from my eyes. He had shown it so often that I think it was more real to him now than the house itself. Jimmy sent it to me. I think it's a very pretty picture. It shows up well, very well. Had you seen him lately? He came out to see me two years ago and bought me the house I live in now. There are a few things to notice here. The first is this idea of pride, right? We get this image of a picture and we see that it's dirty with many hands. This means that Gatz had shown it to people and been like, here, you hold this picture, right? He's spreading his son's picture around, right? He had shown it so often. And then we get this slip between the idea of the image, the replica versus the actual thing, right? The dad is standing in Gatsby's house, but to him, the picture is more real because the picture is part of that fantasy that he's imbued with the aura of his son's success before now. The true, uh, and then of course we see Gatsby's sense in um, success is giving houses. And so of course he gave his dad a house, but notice what he didn't say, right? Jimmy sent it to me. I think it's a pretty picture. It shows up well. It's all about the house. Gatsby didn't send a picture of himself. Instead, he sent a picture of the thing that he represents himself and his self-made new person, which is his house, right? So there's that tension, right? It's not a picture of himself that he sends his dad, it's a picture of his house because that's the new Gatsby and everything it represents. Then we have Gatsby's funeral. 
lonely and raining. We straggled down quickly through the rain to the cars. Owl Eyes spoke to me by the gate. Right, he's the only person that showed up. I couldn't get to the house, he remarked. Neither could anybody else. Go on, he started. Why, my God, they used to go there by the hundreds. He took off his glasses and wiped them again, outside and in. The poor son of a bitch, he said. Here, the major adjective is poor. Because Gatsby, while rich and had the money, the big house, the big cars, the uh, big parties, ultimately ends up being poor in friendship and Owl Eyes offers pity in this last moment. He doesn't have anything else to offer except his presence there. A lot of the interesting words like, like why does Owl Eyes show up? Because well, we've only seen him back in chapter three when he was in the library and then at that car accident and now he shows up and Nick doesn't know why. He seems to show up only as a witness to the party and then a witness to Gatsby's loss. Um, so now we get a little bit more philosophical on Nick's part as he starts wrapping things up and he looks back on his own work. I see now that this has been a story of the West. After all, Tom and Gatsby, Daisy and Jordan and I were all Westerners and perhaps we possessed some deficiency in common which made us subtly unadaptable to Eastern life. So that idea that I talked about in the past of Western mythologized Americana, manifest destiny, things like that, fits in right here. This idea of people that have come back from the West after fulfilling that uh, false kind of Americanized identity and narrative of going to the West, what happens when they try to return? Well, it doesn't work. They've lost something, some deficiency that they have. And we get this sharp juxtaposition and incompatibility between Western and Eastern. And you'll remember that also fits into the different types of the eggs. Only now where uh, we had Tom and Daisy living on East Egg, now get, um, Nick is saying, you know what? They actually belong with me. They're also incompatible with something in the East. This is going to fit into strong themes of the American dream, if that's something you've been tracking. But that's not something I'm going to be very interested in today. All right, I want to look for a little bit at this kind of long paragraph. And we're going to learn a new literary term with this moment. Even when the East excited me most, even when I was most keenly aware of its superiority to the bored, sprawling, swollen towns beyond the Ohio, with their interminable inquisitions, which spared only the children and the very old, even then it had always for me a quality of distortion. West Egg especially still figures in my more fantastic dreams. I see it as a night scene by El Greco, a hundred houses at once conventional and grotesque, crouching under a sullen, overhanging sky and a lustrous moon. In the foreground, four solemn men in dress suits are walking along the sidewalk with a stretcher on which lies a drunken woman in a white evening dress. Her hand, which dangles over the side, sparkles cold with jewels. Gravely, the men turn in at a house, the wrong house, but no one knows the woman's name and no one cares. What we have here in the second half of this paragraph is a description of a work of art. The technical term for when you describe one work of art in another work of art is an ekphrasis. And in my classroom in particular, there's a lot of emphasis on the ekphrastic. When you're in year one, there's gonna be the most beautiful ekphrasis, ekphrasis that exists, which is in Virgil's Aeneid, but it will also be something that we discuss a fair amount in my classes. Because an ekphrasis accomplishes something. So let's look at a couple examples here of El Greco's paintings to kind of give you a sense. Gatsby, uh, Nick is not actually describing a specific painting, although some people will say it seems to largely be the view from Toledo. So 
what is the effect of an ephesus? Well, it allows um, Nick to really delve into this idea of the dream because he can use it as a simile to try to convey the effect of this dream. But the major thing that an ekphrasis does is it creates distance. It gives Nick a space in which to process his feelings by mediating it through another mode. So for instance, when you read the Aeneid in a few years, one of the things you're going to find is Aeneas processing where he's come from by looking at a series of paintings that actually describe the fall of his homeland, the fall of Troy. And so an ekphrastic moment allows you to mediate and process something in your past to your present, and you do it through a description. Uh, even in the midst of all of this, though, we still have some wordplay. We get foreground to four men. Notice they're carrying a stretcher where the drunken woman is on it. This reminds us of the drinking that happened at Gatsby's parties. Specifically, it probably is supposed to remind you of Myrtle and Myrtle at the party in chapter two. We have, instead of the woman who seems to be living, we have the jewels that sparkle cold instead of it being a body. And then the men with a pun turn into a house gravely. So we get all of this language having to do with death and the macabre next to this body that's very difficult to describe. Oddly enough, the men turn in at the wrong house. For a novel that is so obsessed with houses, to feature this at the end of a dream is quite striking. A major difference between this woman, though, and our main women, Myrtle and Daisy, no one knows her name and no one cares. What I think happens at this moment is that Nick is inverting the woman and Gatsby because no one cares about Gatsby's death and no one knows who killed Myrtle, which was actually Daisy. So there's this really amazing, what's called a conflation, where a lot of different elements come together into one. And this is the kind of work a literary dream can do, even more so when you turn it into an ekphrastic moment. It allows you to pull multiple elements together into one, and then you as a reader can kind of unpick them and see what might fit to what, right? You get to be an interpreter of dreams, to use a phrase from Freud. Jordan and Nick have a last conversation. Oh, and do you remember, she added, a conversation we had once about driving a car? Why, not exactly. You said a bad driver was only safe until she met another bad driver. Well, I met another bad driver, didn't I? I mean, it was careless of me to make such a wrong guess. I thought you were rather an honest, straightforward person. I thought it was your secret pride. I'm 30, I said. I'm five years too old to lie to myself and call it honor. She didn't answer. Angry and half in love with her and tremendously sorry, I turned away. Of all the interactions between Jordan and Nick, this is easily the most interesting one because at this point, Nick allows somebody else to maybe say the truest thing about him. Because we've had this issue of Nick taking secret pride before. I, I've always prided myself on being honest, as he said. Well, it turns out that you and I, we all I found these moments of dishonesty on Nick's part. And it begins immediately with this idea of faulty memory. It's why, remember, Nick is our narrator, and yet he keeps saying he doesn't remember things quite right, or he put himself in a state that allowed his memory to become muddled. Daisy, not Daisy, sorry, Jordan here says, hey, you, Nick, you were another bad driver. Right? You thought you were this good driver, but you were not. And when she says this, she calls it careless. Careless is an interesting word, right? Because it combines this idea of you couldn't care less and that you lack care in terms of being careful around you, right? Understanding of other people in certain situations. Nick likes to emphasize the fact that he's 30. It's not the first time that this has come up. And then he gives us this odd bit. Why does he say he's still half in love with her? Well, I'll let you guys think about that. 
Uh, in the same way that the first two pages of The Great Gatsby are enormously important to understand in order to enter into the novel, so too are the last. And the last two pages feature many of the most famous quotations from this book. Phrases that you'll find tattooed on other people, um, put on posters, magazines, and art. I couldn't forgive him. This is uh, after Nick has run into Tom. I couldn't forgive him or like him, but I saw that what he had done was to him entirely justified. It was all very careless and confused. They were careless people, Tom and Daisy. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess they had made. Ellipsis. And Fitzgerald's very careful with his ellipses and we get increasing, an increasing number of them at the end here of the novel. So here's Nick's, one of his last phrases about the difference between himself and this more elite rich class of old money. Specifically, they're careless and what allows them to be careless is their money. Money is something that you can retreat back into. And so each time, and we've had several instances of this, that Tom and Daisy have found a new society and kind of and, uh, went, gone into it, they've actually had to make a retreat and then go move somewhere else. This is a move they're allowed to do though because they have endless supplies of money, it seems. But notice these three iterations of careless, very careless, careless people, vast carelessness. This is Nick taking that word that Jordan had applied to herself and to Nick and he's turning it onto somebody else, right? This is the act of a, uh, somebody who's very petty, right? He's feeling deep insecurities about being called something and so he's like, no, you're the one that's careless. Um, the line here that's famous is, they smashed up things and creatures. Notice this idea of um, sharp dehumanization that we get. Um, the person, right? One person has actually been smashed in this book and that's Myrtle. She was struck by Tom's fist in chapter two and then in chapter seven, she was uh, run over by Daisy. So there's this um, thing that happens there, right? That's really important to notice is Tom and Daisy are the people that have smashed things and smashed creatures, but we dehumanize Myrtle by turning her into a thing and a creature. And Nick seems to be identifying himself as one of these creatures as well, but they're not people at this point. The people are Tom and Daisy versus the creatures and things. So again, the care with which certain words operate. Nick continues, one night I did hear a material car there and saw its lights stop at his front steps, but I didn't investigate. Probably it was some final guest who had been away at the end of the earth and didn't know that the party was over. So an important thing happens here with the mention of his front steps and we're gonna see these come up again a couple times. Um, this is that point at which you'll remember I've used this term of liminality before. Uh, liminality is when you're at the threshold and you can go one way or the other. Here, at this liminal space at Gatsby's house, everything stops. You can't enter the party. That part's over. And so you have to make a retreat. And so it's that point at which the liminal space is rejected. So rather than making a transition and going over it and doing something new, you actually have to retreat and go back. Odd thing calling it a material car, but that seems to be because he's having... Um, hallucinations of cars arriving. Uh, he doesn't investigate. So he's starting to lose interest, but it seems to be a deliberate move on his part. And there's this wonderful bit about his supposition, which he supposes based on probably, that they've been to the end of the earth. So this is about a return. And specifically, it's a return where they find things different. So you'll remember the book begins with Nick also making a return. I mean, his is a return to the Midwest. So the, op the novel is operating on this series of parallels. Yeah, a couple of interesting paragraphs, very, very close to the end. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world. Its vanished trees, 
The trees that had made way for Gatsby's house had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory, enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent, compelled into the ascetic contemplation he neither understood nor desired, face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. And as I sat there brooding on the old, unknown world, I thought of Gatsby's wonder when he first picked out the green light at the end of Daisy's dock. He had come a long way to this blue lawn, and his dream must have seemed so close that he could hardly fail to grasp it. He did not know that it was already behind him, somewhere back in the vast obscurity behind the city, beyond the city, where the dark fields of the Republic rolled on under the night. So one thing that this um, first paragraph I've quoted does is it encourages this examination of American history as American exceptionalist history because it completely elides the fact that there were indigenous populations here and that this is a form of kind of a settler colonialism narrative, right? We get man, but what man seems to be identified by is the European settler. And uh, gets, uh, sorry, Nick immediately aestheticizes things in order to create a distance, right? An aesthetic contemplation means a contemplation about um, the appreciation of the beauty of it, similar to Nick trying, like he performed an aesthetic contemplation of his dream when he compared it to El Greco. But then Nick says, this was the only last point in history when somebody was capable of matching their capacity for wonder with something that is unknown. And this is what gets lost over time. So this is a critique kind of of the modern version of the world, which seems to be like a mercantile world, capitalistic world, that's lost a sense of the aesthetic. So this would be, you're mounting a critique in this novel against the American dream. These would be the places where you found it, specifically because of all of this emphasis on the dreams, the connection of Gatsby, Gatsby's wonder. You'll remember from page two, Gatsby's capacity for hope. What I wanted you to notice, though, is the care with which these paragraphs are um, put together. We have the new world, which is a paradox because it's the now present old world. And so we have this tension with what, how does time work in this novel, right? Is it cyclical? Is it linear? Does it move backwards? What, does, what do words even mean when suddenly you have old and new describing the same thing? I am not going to talk about this green light right there because the entire internet will tell you what it thinks it means. The last paragraph. Gatsby believed in the green light, the orgastic future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms further, farther, ellipsis, and one fine morning, dash. So we beat on, boats against the current, Born back ceaselessly into the past. These lines are the culmination of the way in which time is represented in this book. Notice that we have recedes, which means to move backwards, before us. So we get that oxymoron, that paradox. It eluded us then, but that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch our arms out further, and one fine morning. So we beat on against the current born back into the past. So there's this idea that even as you're attempting to move time in a linear matter, you actually don't make progress when you're forced backwards. So you might think about this as Nick, the more he's trying to write into the present, he keeps having more things to write about in the past. That's one way in which that works. So it's just interesting, uh, especially because this idea at the end of beating on, right, to, to be rowing versus the born back. You have the active and the passive that are placed into sharp juxtaposition. This is related to all the language we've had about drifting and currents throughout the novel. And so I've been talking about that and picking it up in order to lay the groundwork that culminates at this point. So these are all passages that are quite frequently talked about. Um, again, Fitzgerald's worked very, very hard on these last passages, and so it's exciting to get to put some pressure on them. 
The one that interests me the most, though, is this bit about erasure. On the last night, with my trunk packed and my car sold to the grocer, I went over and looked at that huge, incoherent failure of a house once more. On the white steps, an obscene word, scrawled by some boy with a piece of brick, stood out clearly in the moonlight, and I erased it, drawing my shoe raspingly along the stone. Then I wandered down to the beach and sprawled out on the sand. So the thing I want to mention here is that this is a moment that is called meta-literary. This is a word I've mentioned a few times, but the meta-literary is when you have a moment in a book that's about writing a book. You can also have a moment in a book about reading. We had that a little bit with like the owl-eyed man. But this is a meta-literary moment, right? Because what is the act of erasing something obscene? Well, it's Nick's process of writing this book. When he leaves out certain moments, certain obscenities, and he smooths things over. So we might consider this a literalizing of the act of writing this book. Nick confesses to us his process. He tries to make things pure and clear and unsullied. One of the things that we get there when he draws his shoe raspingly is this word rasp. And a rasp is something that smooths out other pieces of metal. So it's a piece of metal with grooves in it that you use to grind down other pieces of metal. At the same time, get, uh, Nick calls the house an incoherent failure. Incoherent means something that you can't fully understand. But what he's tried to do, what he Nick has tried to do, is render the house coherent. And he's done that by erasing. So this is a moment of a really, really fun, interesting confession on the part of Nick and his process of writing this book and one of the things that lies behind it. So I hope you've enjoyed this discussion of Gatsby. At this point, you can enjoy the ways in which Twitter loves Gatsby. So we'll start here. Sparknotes especially will create viral tweets regularly out of Gatsby. Um, they respond to Wint saying, block, 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 you're all blocked. None of you are free of sin. Nick Carraway in chapter one, you shouldn't judge people. Nick Carraway for the rest of the book. Block, 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 right? So we have talked about these, this um, incompatibility that's invalidated to us from Nick's part. Um, the library owl said, so far, the Roaring Twenties is turning out to have a lot more nightmare pandemics and a lot fewer Long Island parties and flappers with bobbed hair dancing to Charleston than I had expected. So this is a sense that The Great Gatsby is the great novel of the Roaring Twenties. And the, um, at the start of 2020, people were making all of these jokes about how it was going to be a return to that. And then, of course, we entered COVID-19. Library Owl also said, and these were like back in March, day one of quarantine. Time to sit down and write the great American novel. A three of quarantine. Maybe Baz Luhrmann said, I want the music for the great Gatsby to be jazzy. And his composer thought he said Jay-Z. This is a reference to the latest film adaptation, which stars Leonardo DiCaprio as Gatsby. You can find clips of that online. Um, John Boyega of Star Wars fame said, the bloody things I do for Daisy, lol, meaning Daisy from the latest trilogy of Star Wars, but Johanna Desta decided, hey, no one says this, but Jay Gatsby, Jay Gatsby says it. And so that's a reference that you all now understand. Furthermore, you'll get this viral tweet from Sparknotes where they said, the great Gatsby spoilers, but there's no context, right? You now understand what the green light is. This idea from Game of Thrones of living mostly in the past. SpongeBob with these big eyes, right? That's going to be a reference to your billboard. And then, Michael from the office, occasionally I'll hit someone with my car, so sue me, all of which you understand. Um, and then a final tweet from Sparknotes. If you want to throw a Gatsby theme New Year's party, you'll need champagne, jazz music, the American dream corrupted, a culture of decadence and mass consumerism that will ultimately give way to economic disaster. All right? So the internet, Twitter in particular, loves Gatsby. One of the things that you've done by reading this book is entered into the cultural conversation that can take part in these kind of tweets, mock it, um, enjoy it, but know that you are part of a vast, vast readership that's also engaged with these texts. So 
Just wrapping up quickly, one question for the forum. Now that you have read all of The Great Gatsby, what do you think Nick meant when he wrote the following on page two? No, Gatsby turned out all red. Right, no, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. Thank you for coming on this journey through The Great Gatsby with me, and I wish you all great reading in the future.